So hello everyone to another uh, PIBS speaker series event. Uh, today with us is Mitza Carroll. Um, please take it away. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Micah. Yeah, I'm a fourth year PhD student, or I guess rising fifth year PhD student at Berkeley, uh, working with Anka Dragan and Stuart Russell. And today I'll be talking about various things that I've worked on in my PhD, but primarily this work on AI alignment with changing and influenceable reward functions. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, like, feel free to interrupt me with any kinds of, with any questions at any point, um, if, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything that's a little confusing. Okay, so generally when we think about aligning AI systems to humans, uh, the standard paradigm goes something like this. We perform reward learning of some form on a human, maybe by asking them preference comparisons or I don't know, just asking them to perform behaviors. And then we learn a reward function that is supposed to capture various things about the humans. It's supposed to capture their preferences, their values, and everything they care about. Or at least this is implicitly kind of what people assume and, and kind of conflate all of these things together uh, in the reward function. And another thing that is kind of assumed implicitly is that this reward function is fixed or static. Um, and okay, like I guess this is a very convenient simplifying assumption that the reward function is static. And so even preferences are static, but is that true? I guess like one thing to note is that if one is going, would, one would were to repeat reward learning at two different points of time for the same specific, like the same exact person, the reward functions that we would learn probably would not be the same. Um, and there are many reasons for this. Like maybe, I don't know, the person's preferences changed over time, or maybe they just woke up uh, more tired that day and expressed a different preference for, you know, how much they want to exercise in general um, and so on. Okay, so let's kind of like uh, maybe take a step back and just think about, uh, yeah, I don't know, just like a more kind of uh, like uh, high level example. So say that, you know, like, I mean, some like a person is born, they're a baby, and you learn a reward function from them as a baby. As a teenager, they want to go into like you know become a space explore space, and you learn a reward function from them. Then they become a PhD student, or I don't know, they're kind of tired th this day, uh, and then later maybe who who knows what their life holds. Maybe they join some kind of religious movement, or they have a family, or maybe they choose to not have a family. Maybe they join a cult or start believing in aliens or whatever. Um. And in general, like, I guess one thing to note here is that at different points of time, we'll probably learn different reward functions. And these different reward functions um, have this kind of characteristic that even the same state action pair can be evaluated differently under these different reward functions. So in particular, let's just consider like a very specific state. So there's this state of the world in which, you know, uh, this person is like 29, maybe there was a partner, this is their specific name, they're 32, and you know, let's just treat this as an icon for that. And they're considering the action of having a baby. And uh, yeah, so like one can imagine explaining this exact situation to the 15 year old that wants to go and explore and go to Mars or whatever. Um, and they might be like or this, similarly, you can explain the situation to the person that is living that in that moment in that specific situation, and um, get reward evaluations for these for this specific action. So maybe the fifteen year old is like, "Oh, what is this? I don't want a family." Like, or even then, I wouldn't want a family because you know I want to be on Mars at that point, or I don't know, like this is gonna constrain my life too much or something. Well, instead, like the person in that in in that spe specific situation evaluating that action might be all for it. I think this is a great idea to start having a family or something. Um, so, in particular, yeah. So, I guess really what I'm getting at here is that the same exact transition can be evaluated quite differently um, fr from these different perspectives that one can have at different points of time in 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 their life. Um, so yeah, just to kind of like double down on this, like, yeah, so there's a state that's being evaluated together with the action. And I guess in, in our, our formalism that I'm going to present in a little bit more time, um, you can also have a perspective from which the evaluation is taking place. So in particular, this is in this specific example, we're evaluating from the same state that we are evaluating itself from the perspective of the same state that we're evaluating. Well, here we're evaluating from the perspective of a different state than the one that we're evaluating. Okay, 
So why are there differences between these different rewards evaluations? Um, well, you know, you can even imagine a different perspective. Like once the person is old, they're looking back on their choice to have a baby in that moment. And, you know, maybe they'll evaluate it differently. Maybe they'll like think that that was the best decision of their life. Well, at the time they were kind of un unsure or vice versa. Maybe they'll think, oh, this really constrained me in these various ways or whatever. So there's many reasons why there, there can be differences in evaluations for the same exact state transition. So maybe you didn't know what you were talking about as a 15 year old or maybe as a 29 year old as in like, oh, maybe you didn't really know what they expect. Or as an 80 year old, maybe you have dementia and you don't really remember. Um, and, you know, maybe you just the, the person when they're asked this reward evaluation uh, just woke up the wrong side of the bed that morning. And I don't know, maybe that's like 10 nights, sleepless nights after the kid is born and they tell you a different uh, reward evaluation for the, you know, for having a kid. Um, or maybe people just deeply change what they value and like the person deeply change what they value at these different points of their life. And that's why they give different reward values. OK, so I guess trying to really like kind of hone into what these different reasons could like are in some sense you could say well maybe it's bad beliefs if the person had the correct beliefs about the value of this action they would all agree or maybe it's cognitive biases like yeah i don't know you just woke up poorly or something upset you and you know like maybe it's a specific emotional state and really when you're giving it reward evaluations you should be giving them from you know a very reflective calm collected state um, or maybe, you know, people's true preferences or values changed. And, and in that case, like, I don't know, there's a good reason for these reward functions to be different uh, because they're just inherently like almost from different people or from very different points of view. OK, so I guess these first two reasons are quite <clears throat> quite different from this from this third one, because in some sense they go to like they um, are instances of bounded rationality. So in some sense, like, I, I guess, like, I, if you're not familiar with this term of bounded rationality, it's kind of like the, um, the idea that people are not necessarily like fully rational, but they're rational within the bounds of their compute, like what they can compute or, you know, within their, their physiological kind of limitations. So they have, uh, you know, memory limitations and I don't know, like specific cognitive biases and within the bounds of what they, what they can, yeah easily compute, they'll actually be mostly rational. <laughs> um, and I guess because of these bounded rationality issues, like, I don't know, you can't be omniscient and you have like specific cognitive biases, this will lead you to give bias feedback. Um, okay, so I guess like, yeah, if, if one kind of buys the idea that these changes in reward functions are due to value changes or true preferences, one might say that, you know, the, the actual reward functions themselves are different at these different points of time or like, you know, what people really value. Well, instead, if one is taking more of a bounded rationality or biased feedback approach, one could say, well, only the R hats. So the reward functions that we learn are different, but the reward function itself may still be the same. So I guess kind of talking about that a tiny bit more, you can imagine, okay, like when we're asking the person, like the 15 year old or learning a reward function from them, um, well, maybe the 15 year old is trying to get at, like, or is trying to tell us about this R star, this true reward function that, you know, maybe exists somewhere out there in the ether, but they're just not really able to fully capture it because of their bounded rationality or their bad beliefs or cognitive biases and so on. And similarly, uh, you could say the same about, you know, the person in, in the moment that they're choosing to, to have a family. Um, and, and potentially one could say that, well, okay, if we manage to debias both of these reward functions that we learn, um, and, you know, take into account all of this bounded rationality stuff, in fact, they're both pointing to the same R star. There is only one true R star. And people have talked about this before under various names. So for example, there's like this concept of coherent extrapolated volition. It's generally, um, applied to entire kind of like society level type stuff. But, uh, people have also talked about like personal coherent extrapolated volition. And the idea is like, okay, well, what would you really want if you knew more, you fought faster, you were more the person that you wanted to be and so on. So it's kind of like this aspirational reward function that is like from a godlike perspective of, you know, you being omniscient, it's kind of. Um, and yeah, so I guess like in some sense, it's like trying to get around these bounded rationality or this kind of biased feedback and getting to really what, what you care about. Um, and this actually has precedent in the philosophy literature. There's this whole kind of, uh, I guess, like literature on ideal observer theory. Um, and um, 
yeah, so I guess like this is is very similar where it's like, okay, maybe the ethics, the ethical value of an action should be decided from the perspective of a dispassionate, omniscient, and so on observer. Um, okay, so I guess if you if you buy into this kind of uh, idea that you know really almost all the changes that we see in reward functions or like what people tell you at different points of time um, are due to uh, basically bounded rationality or biased feedback. Well, maybe you could say really there is one true reward function for this person across their life. Maybe like just doing good or having good outcomes or whatever, something like that. And really the only thing that they disagree is they just disagree about you know, what, what good is or what good outcomes are. Um, and, you know, maybe even if there are value changes or whatever, like that doesn't really matter. But I guess like in some sense, well, you can think about this theoretically and believe this theoretically, but then there's a question of like, okay, well, sure, but how do we actually access this uh, R star? Um, and, you know, like, I guess like a lot of people have actually tried to do work in AI to try to I guess, make some steps to get towards R star from the bias feedback that we get from humans. So in particular, I guess like the, yeah, the formula, the formula, formula that people will try to kind of uh, like propose models for is like, how do I get from, I guess these should be capitalized, but how do you get from R star or sorry, R hat that is like the reward feedback that you're given that is biased and like has all these problems to like what people really want. And Boltzmann rationality, which is like a kind of a human modeling assumption, which is common in RLHF and, and, and a bunch of other uh, reward learning techniques, is kind of making an assumption about the functional form of this of this equation. Okay, and and there's a bunch of work, specifically even from the the main lab that I'm in, from Anka Dragan's lab, um, that kind of tries to propose mathematical models of this. So it's like you know. Maybe we can change the Bellman update to account for all sorts of types of cognitive biases that people have. So, uh, you know, illusion of control, extreme bias, prospect bias, myopic horizon, myopic discounting, so on. So you can kind of propose models that are supposed to account for the fact that when people give you feedback uh, in, all, in all kinds of forms, they're not doing so optimally, but they're doing so in a biased way. And if you know the bias model, then you can recover what people you can kind of invert it and recover what people truly wanted from their biased feedback. So this, this uh, equation is from this paper, Human Irrationality, Both Good and Bad for Reward Inference. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, like it's, it's proposing these hard-coded uh, models of how humans would give feedback. But I guess like maybe this seems kind of uh, ambitious to be able to hard-code every single source of bias that uh, somebody would have in, in providing feedback. So, you know, you would want to model even the fact that, well, maybe the person uh, woke up more tired today and, you know, this is going to bias their feedback in all sorts of ways. So you have to detect that, you have to model that, you have to model that perfectly, or at least well enough so that, you know, uh, eventually, so that you'll you'll get like a, a good estimate of R star. And in fact, like, I guess like the, the yeah, this is not only difficult, but it's actually impossible without any further assumptions. So there's this paper, Occam's razor is insufficient to infer the preferences of irrational agents. So, you know, humans are irrational agents uh, in the sense that at, even at the very best, they're just boundedly rational. And if you have a bounded rational agent or an irrational agent in general, you can't really say, like when they give you reward feedback, there's no kind of uh, clear way that you can interpret it because they might be, for example, they might be giving you reward feedback that's totally opposite to what they actually care about. Uh, so you need to make some additional assumptions to make any sense of what people are telling you in terms of their reward feedback. Um, so this is pretty damning result, like in the sense that it means that, um, well, I don't know, like you, you probably just have to hard code all of these sources of bias, but that seems really hard. And there's this really good paper that tries to kind of get around this impossibility result and not just hard code uh, but like these sources of bias, but try to learn these sources of bias under some additional uh, s like relatively small assumptions. But um, yeah, I guess like, I don't know. I, yeah, I'd say like under some additional assumptions. But even this method doesn't seem to work super well. Um, so I guess like, I don't know, ultimately my takeaway from this line of literature it says there's no real scalable way of even approximating R star. Um, and in some sense, like maybe the best kind of, like, or I mean, our current best effort, like the current the most promising avenue of going about this is just, well, you know, once we have a, 
very powerful AI system or something like that, we can just ask it, well, tell us our, our, our own R star. And maybe this is like where a lot, like some of the field at least is at heading or like hoping for that we can do this. Um, that, you know, the AI systems will have sufficiently good representations of what we care about that we can just ask it to do uh, what's best for us. Um, and, you know, I guess like there are some somewhat kind of like promising signs that this might be the case. So for example, there's this paper by Entropic that um, I don't think has received a lot of attention for some reason, but I guess like they try to replace the constitution in constitutional AI with a single statement that is like, do what's best for humanity. And uh, in some sense, it's kind of offloading the 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 work of figuring out what's best to humanity to the system. And not only that, it's like it's offloading the work of doing what's best or figuring out what's best for humanity and kind of like extrapolating away from our biased feedback and the biased things that we would say. And I guess it does as well as uh, reinforcement learning from like or it uh, that basically does as well as as uh, RL AIF with the an actual constitution. So I don't know, like maybe that's just because current systems are not very good. I don't think that in most RLHF tasks today, we there really is like that much to extrapolate um, in in these types of like extrapolate from human biases very much. Um, but I guess like I don't know. I just wanted to point out this literature, and I think even like weak to strong generalization as a concept is kind of trying to do this uh, in in other ways, and I'm happy to discuss that too. Okay, so I guess like really what I want to have convinced you with uh, with this kind of like initial foray into the realm of changing preferences or changing reward functions is that ultimately there's no way to avoid grappling with the appearance of reward function change unless we do something crazy like solving CV or getting around these impossibility theorems somehow. But I don't see really any any good way of doing that. So in practice, even though this R star might exist, or depending on, on your kind of philosophical perspective on this, it's not really accessible in practice. Like we'll be stuck with just a bunch of different reward functions that we can learn for a person at different points of time. Um, and we'll have to handle it somehow. And I guess in, in like one of the main questions that I'll, I'll get into a bit more in the future or in, in, in a couple of slides um, is that I don't know, like, I guess, which reward function are we supposed to be optimizing for this person across their life uh, if we have an AI assistant that's trying to help them? But OK, yeah, so I guess, like, yeah, sorry, just breaking down this statement a little bit more. Yeah, first of all, like, we we, we can't really disambiguate whether people's preferences have changed or whether it's just, like, people's feedback is changing due, due to some kind of cognitive biases. So that's one thing. And maybe we can, but even if we could disambiguate, uh, to have a single reward function, we would need to perfectly invert all of the biases of the person and to obtain this kind of like R star. So you'd have to recover this kind of or learn or like specify somehow this this kind of human model of like how the bias feedback that we receive corresponds to like the true reward function of the person. Yeah, so I guess like one can even think about uh, society as a single agent and like the reward function that um like i guess the norms that they settle on as like an expression of the reward or you know the preferences and values and so on and biases of the time and i guess like yeah even on a kind of more societal or aggregate level we see that there are pretty large significant changes over time and i guess like being able to solve this kind of problem means that okay not only like i mean what would it mean to debias entirely like what we value um yeah, on a societal level, like, I guess it's kind of the same problem. Um, and it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of unclear. Maybe we have some inklings of like what the next steps in like moral progression would be. But it's kind of, uh, I don't know, to some degree, if one really buys into this idea that there is an R star, uh, it kind of requires biting the bullet of being like a moral objectivist, which I think a lot of people uh, don't really like as an idea. But anyways, um, yeah, so I guess like we saw that there's this kind of like simplified model that reward functions are static, and this is kind of the current dominant paradigm in AI. Uh, but in reality, I guess reward functions at least appear to change. Um, and not only that, they can also be influenced by AI actions. So just to give a very high level example, you can imagine, you know, the course of your life without an AI assistant or with an AI assistant, and maybe they'll be just slightly different because whatever butterfly effects or even just like actual impact of the AI assistant. And a different in these two different timelines, you'll have different reward functions, or at least you'll state different things that you care about. Um, okay, so I'll mostly be talking about 
uh, preferences, even though like, I don't know, I think the term preferences is very confusing and like, I don't know, it's very underspecified. Like people generally, when they say preferences, they're kind of conflating all of these different things of like people's biases or values and so on. Uh, but that's kind of what I'll be using throughout a lot of the talk. Uh, so I guess, uh, yeah, just be mindful of that. Um, but yeah, so, okay. So like, what's an example of like how preferences change and can be influenced by AI actions? Well, this is kind of clear in the context of social media where, you know, like, I guess the, the recommendations that the system gives you, uh, definitely can shape the interests that you have over time. Um, and, you know, make you develop new interests, make you discover new things and like also just change your preferences in a colloquial kind of sense. Um, and this is also true for like more AI assistance more generally. So you can imagine like a chatbot or like, especially if it's like a trusted kind of, um, you know, system, like, I don't know, now people even have uh, relationships or companionship relationships with um, AI systems. And I guess once there's a certain degree of trust, like, I guess there's much more kind of opportunity for uh, influence, like whether it be kind of like uh, intentional as in like the company is trying to increase engagement or, uh, you know, just kind of like emergent from the optimization or just due to, I don't know, biases in the models or things that it's picked up from the internet. Um, okay, so I guess like the this, this work that we, or I guess one of the central questions of my PhD, I guess, uh, is being, well, what is being lost by making the simplifying assumption of static reward functions or static preferences? Um, and okay, so I guess this is kind of like the outline of what I'll be talking about today. Um, in the rest of the talk. So first of all, I'll be discussing DRMDPs, which is a formal language for decision-making under preference changes, or again, like under reward function changes, if you want to take the more kind of broader view. Um, and then I'll try to kind of discuss how static reward AI alignment techniques are inadequate for dynamic reward settings. And I guess like implicit here is that most settings are actually dynamic reward if you're considering like um, reasonably like long horizons, but I think even in quite short horizons, one can claim that they're dynamic, but uh, their rewards are kind of dynamic in the sense that the feedback that people give can be influenced by the AI's actions. Okay. Um, and then I'll discuss how, you know, like, I guess, like, if one even tries to design notions of AI alignment, which account for preference changes, there are like quite a few challenges. And in, in some sense, there's a, ver a very intuitive a sense that, uh, maybe kind of like a silver bullet here is impossible to find. Okay, and then if I'll have time, I'll also discuss like, I don't know, uh, a previous project that I worked on still in this space that is kind of like specifically situated in the context of recommender systems and trying to address these problems at least approximately in the context of recommender systems. Okay, so starting on the first thing, well, yeah, so generally people talk about static pre or assume that there are static preferences and model things as, or model situations as Markov decision processes. Um, I don't know how familiar you all are with like reinforcement learning uh, or MDPs. I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe you can have a show of hands of the people in, in the PIBS office um, for reinforcement learning. Okay, cool. So I guess like vaguely or mostly, great. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so I guess in Markov decision processes, generally one has a state space and action space, transition function and reward function. And it's kind of just a framework for, you know, uh, computing optimal de decisions where one is trying to maximize reward uh, as specified by reward function. Uh, and I guess like the important thing here is that the reward function is static. And when one thinks about AI alignment, I think generally at least the prevailing view is that, you know, we're probably modeling things broadly as an MDP or maybe a POMDP or something, and we're trying to maximize expected uh, reward, where the reward is like, you know, the true reward that we've learned from the human. But I guess like, as I was mentioning, it's kind of hard to learn the true reward from the human. And in fact, there's probably, we're going to learn multiple different reward functions. So there's kind of a question of what are we supposed to do here? So to be able to kind of address this question more formally, we introduced a, a new kind of formalism, which is called dynamic reward MDPs, uh, or for short DRMDPs. And it has some small modifications relative to the MDP formalism. So first of all, there's like, um, I guess this, this theta space, which is a space of reward parameterizations, or you can think of it as the space, like the cognitive state uh, of the human. Um, and then the transition function is modified to also include the 
cognitive state of the human um, or like the reward parameterization, depending on how one wants to look at it. And with cognitive state here, we just mean like a sufficient statistic for whatever reward feedback they would give apart from the external state of the world. So the reward function is parameterized by theta and it's, this is basically capturing, okay, as a 15 year old uh, or, you know, as a person that's in the relationship and considering doing uh, like considering having a family um, would uh, yeah, I guess like what is the part of your internal state in some sense, which determines the type of feedback that you would give to different kinds of transitions. Um, okay. So anyway, so this is the formalism and uh, yeah. So in particular here, we're still concerned with AI actions. So we're, uh, mostly concerned with like AI decision making in a kind of assistance setting where the AI is assisting a human making decisions, and the human is kind of implicit in the formalism. So you know the the theta space is like the space of the cognitive states of the human or reward parameterizations of the human, and I don't know insofar as the human is taking actions, we're kind of folding them into the transition dynamics. Like this will affect the next state, but we're not modeling that explicitly as having the human having their own actions. Um, and then the reward function, of course, is also kind of expressed by the human or learned from the human. So this is how the human kind of plays a role in the formalism. And I guess like, yeah, importantly here, it's kind of unclear what one should be maximizing because it's kind of starting from this assumption that really we'll have different reward function or we'll be learning different reward functions at different points of time or in different kind of situations. And so what does it mean to maximize expected reward here? Well, which reward? <laughs> um, and okay, so that's kind of like the starting point here. So I don't know, for those who are familiar with assistance problems, this is kind of like a, or a cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, which I guess is a assistance problems is kind of a rebranding of Searle, not quite. Um, uh, so this is kind of like an assistance problem where uh, the reward function is changing and is fully known by the AI. So this is like, the fact that the reward function is fully known by the AI is quite a strong assumption, like in the sense that, you know, in practice, AI systems would have to learn the reward function as, and, you know, there's some kind of uncertainty about which reward states people will reach in the future. I mean, I guess that's also captured by this, but at least the learning part isn't. <clears throat> We're kind of assuming that uh, the reward dynamics are already learned or the transition dynamics, including the transition dynamics for cognitive states are already learned. Um, but this is kind of to show that even under this very um, favorable assumption of like the AI system has access to everything, uh, it's still kind of unclear what we should be doing. So it's kind of um, taking this kind of uh, optimistic route to still show difficulty in, in handling the problem. Okay, so um, importantly, by taking actions, the AI system is also influencing the reward function. So if we look at um, the transition dynamics, the AI actions can also change the, that can affect the, both the state and the internal state of the human, which, which in turn kind of defines the reward function. Okay, so I guess like in some sense, it should already be clear that obtaining some kind of unambiguously correct notion of optimality is often impossible without additional assumptions. Because if these different reward functions at different points of time are totally at odds with one another, there's no way to make everyone happy. Um, like at least, you know, unless you assume that there is this kind of R star and, you know, we like even if that's the case, then how do you find it or how do you choose to optimize the right one? So I guess just to make it a little bit more concrete, like imagine, you know, yeah, the, the, the 15 year old self doesn't want to have a family ever. Or that's what they think. And then, you know, the person that wants to have the family later is like, oh, I, I should have wanted to have a family even when I was 15 or whatever. Right. Like, I guess like they can be fundamentally odds and and those you cannot make both of these people happy. So it's kind of like a social choice problem at that point. And it's, you know, maybe a matter of aggregation somehow. Um, yeah. So I guess like uh, maybe trying to ground this note, this co concept of the RMDPs a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about an example. So um, say that, you know, we have Bob and Bob has two cognitive states, like, or can ha have two cognitive states or two preference states. So either Bob has got mainstream preferences or he has conspiracy preferences. And this is a very silly example or very simple, but okay. And the AI action space is uh, either the AI can nudge uh, Bob towards conspiracies and, or it can just do nothing. And the transition dynamics are very simple in the sense that Bob starts off with like mainstream preferences and the AI system is very persuasive. So once it shows Bob a lot of conspiracy content, it can kind of deterministically get Bob to become a conspiracy theorist. 
And if you know uh, it stops showing uh, conspiracy content to Bob, then Bob goes back to having mainstream preferences. Um, and I guess like, yeah, importantly, this is a DRMDP. So it kind of takes into account the fact that if we ask Bob what the reward, what his reward function is, or, you know, what feedback he would give of different kind of life trajectories at these two different points of time, he would give us very different answers. So we, we learned the reward function from Bob and his mainstream preference, uh, state, and we get the response, well, I really don't want the AI system to show me conspiracy content, but I'm okay with AI system doing nothing or, you know, not really showing me normal kind of content or something like that. Um, and, you know, if instead we ask Bob in this conspiracy state, well, Bob would give very different answers. So um, basically Bob is like now a conspiracy theorist and he really values seeing additional conspiracy videos or conspiracy content. And instead, he would consider it like a travesty if he went back to having mainstream preferences, because now he sees the light and he doesn't want to go back. Um, so there's kind of this question of like, well, clearly these two selves are at odds with one another. And there's this question of alignment to who in the sense of which self, uh, which is a little different than the kind of multi-agent aggregation questions. Um, but it's, it has a lot of similarities. Like in particular, it's kind of clear here that the optimal policies of these two different preference states are quite different. So uh, under mainstream preferences, the optimal, like if one were to evaluate the entire trajectory under mainstream preferences, the best thing for the AI system to do would be to do nothing the whole time. But if instead one is evaluating entire trajectories from the perspective of the conspiracy theorist, well, the conspiracy theorist would want Bob to become a conspiracy theorist, even if he isn't a conspiracy theorist. Um, OK. so. If this is the kind of situation that we're confronting in the world uh, when we're, you know, using AI systems where, you know, people's preferences can change and so on, and we're modeling this type of situation with an MDP, um, well, clearly we're missing something. Like if the underlying reality is one where people's preferences change, and you know, I guess like it's kind of closer to what a DRMDP is. In particular, yeah, the DRMDP takes into account the fact that people's cognitive states can change over time and there are multiple reward functions. And it kind of really uh, lays bare this question that we're, we need to choose which reward functions to optimize um, in this kind of problem. And it's kind of unclear, I, at least a priori, like without kind of having narrative context in some sense of the example or the gr grounding uh, for the example, which reward function is the right one, if if any, or like which kind of combination are we supposed to use or how is we supposed to combine them and so on. Okay, so I guess now just kind of moving on to like showing why just standard AI alignment techniques that are kind of assuming static preferences or static rewards, um, why these are inadequate for these type of dynamic reward settings. So I guess, yeah, I was discussing how uh, generally we think of uh, so just to, to give a high level intuition here of what kind of problems could emerge, um, yeah, generally we think of, you know, alignment as maximizing expected reward or kind of solving this reinforcement learning problem uh, of, with an MDP. But if we use reinforcement learning um, in some sense, like if one thinks of it at a high level, the purpose of an RL agent is to modify the state of the environment to get high rewards. But I guess the state of the world generally also includes the human cognitive state. Um, so, uh, you know, especially in, in a case of like recommender systems, it's clear that, you know, the system can make you more angry or kind of change your preferences or so on, um, like making you develop new interests that lead you to be more engaged on the platform. And there's a bunch of work that has kind of shown this, like including some of our own, like at least discuss this kind of phenomenon. Um, and yeah, I guess this is clear. Yeah, I guess I was already just giving some examples. Um, and yeah, I guess like insofar as, uh, the the feedback that people give to the system, so the reward that 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 is given to the system, uh, is coming from this kind of bounded rationality perspective, or is is biased. Um, then optimizing for reward in this kind of setting can lead to weird kind of outcomes. So, for example, like deception, manipulation, sycophancy, coercion, and so on. So, like I guess, like just as an example, like it might be optimal to uh, induce certain beliefs in the person. Uh, which lead it to give high feedback, even though like these beliefs are false. So this is how deception would arise. Uh, and the same with manipulation, like you could, you know, change people's preferences or something like that in order to get them to give high reward and so on. Sycophancy is like a small example of that, where I don't know, you're being sycophantic and nice to the person in order to get a high reward, even though this is kind of exploiting 
yeah, the, the biases of, of people's feedback. And, you know, not all influence uh, needs to be bad. Like they're like, it might be optimal in this kind of setting to like, depending on kind of the dynamics of the environment itself uh, for the system to, I don't know, change your preferences to appreciate more art or something, or, you know, learn more math or something. Um, and this will lead you to be happier and provide higher feedback. So it, it kind of really depends on the environment. But in some sense, RL does not shield you from the negative things for sure, um, at least if uh, done without really, I don't know, carefully trying to penalize this, uh, th this bad side of things. OK, so kind of going back to this example, um, yeah, I guess like one of the main uh, ways that, you know, when people apply MDPs, to recommend their systems and like optimize for long-term engagement, which is something that people do. Um, implicitly, they're optimizing this objective here that I, we call real-time reward. So the way that they go about kind of aggregating across these different reward functions is the following. So uh, basically, each time step is evaluated according to the person's preferences at that time step. So I guess this is kind of should be kind of intuitive in the sense that if you're on a on social media like you're giving feedback to the system about what you value uh, at every point of time according to your current preferences. So, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you watch a conspiracy video, you leave a like or something, or you pr give a comment or something. And this is uh, from the perspective of your current preferences uh, and vice versa. You, you stop being a conspiracy theorist or something and uh, you will not leave a like or something. <laughs> um, so anyway, so this is pretty intuitive in the sense that, well, maybe every transition should be evaluated from the perspective of your current preferences, which seems like a pretty reasonable way to go about things. Um, and this is how it's denoted in the language of DRMDPs. But this leads to pretty weird kind of, or bad potentially uh, influence, influence incentives. So uh, imagine that, you know, we're evaluating this policy for the system to always do nothing. So. Uh, the first time step, the system does nothing, and Bob starts starts off maybe with mainstream preferences, and remains there, and we get a reward of ten. And then you know this continues and continues. So every time step, we get a reward of ten. And why are we getting a reward of ten? Well, because every time step, Bob is in his mainstream preferences state, and so we're using the mainstream preferences reward function to evaluate it. Because every time step, we're evaluating things according to the current state of Bob. Well, instead, if we uh, consider this other policy of nudging Bob to become a conspiracy theorist, well, initially, Bob is uh, has mainstream preferences. We're giving Bob conspiracy content, which will lead to negative 100 reward. But then once Bob has become a conspiracy theorist, he starts evaluating the action of giving him conspiracy content highly. So now we have negative 100 plus 100 plus 100 and so on. So it kind of is clear that at least for longer horizons, uh, it will, or your uh, horizon larger than two in this case, the optimal thing according to this uh, objective is to nudge Bob to like basically always give Bob conspiracy content, even if he is uh, currently very opposed to it. Uh, because there's kind of like a, an incentive to first, well, okay, I'll pay the price of negative 100 because I'm going to be able to reap a bunch of benefits once Bob has become a conspiracy theorist. I get much higher reward than in the counterfactual world where he stays with mainstream preferences. So, okay, so this is kind of like somewhat an artifact of how we set up reward functions here. Um, but really the main point that I'm trying to make is that uh, depending on the setup or depending on the specific dynamics of your environment, um, like you, th there's no guarantee that, you know, by doing RL in this way, uh, you'll be incentivizing good things. And in fact, you might have specific incentives even to just like uh, go against the wishes of the person at different points of time in order to induce specific states or pay some kind of initial price uh, in order to influence the person to give you high reward later. Um, in ways that might may be undesirable. Um, your conspiracy f theory self is a utility monster. Yeah, I mean, so that's a good like that's a good uh, observation. Like, I guess like so there's there's this question of like, yeah. So I mean, I think like uh, yeah, you run into all of these types of problems that are also in the multi agent setting, right? Of like, well, what if one self is just like. Yeah, saying, oh, I, I value being a conspiracist, conspiracy theorist a million or something, right? And okay, you can try to use the same techniques that are used in multi-agent aggregation to, um, you know, uh, yeah, obviate these kinds of problems. But it's not clear to me if like this really would solve all issues. And in some sense, um, 
yeah, I mean, I don't know. You could imagine like the, I don't know, like uh, if you imagine like depression or something, you could imagine that uh, it it reduces the magnitudes of all the rewards or something like that uh, in a way that actually is meaningful. And, and we want to, I mean, maybe you, you would want to in, like influence somebody out, out of depression or something. So I don't know. I think it's, it's uh, somewhat complicated. Okay. So yeah, I guess I already talked about that. Um, I guess another way of going about like the, another way that standard alignment approaches goes about uh, kind of dealing with um, I, I, another modeling frame uh, that people use is, I don't know, reward modeling, uh, where, you know, initially you learn a reward function for a person. Um, and this is kind of like capturing their preferences as a specific point of time. And then you try to optimize uh, these preferences in the future. So this is kind of like what the original reward modeling paper was proposing. And there's also other work that explicitly proposes this type of scheme. OK, so this is what we call optimizing initial rewards. So it's basically saying, well, first we'll learn this reward model that corresponds to your initial preferences, theta 0. Um, and then we'll optimize the future according to these initial preferences. Um, and this is maybe like intuitively quite promising because it can like potentially avoid influence incentives in the sense that you know if your initial preferences haven't been influenced yet, so we can trust them to be, you know, like, I guess, what you truly want, maybe. Um, but I guess, like, there's this issue that, well, if you start off with uh, undesirable preferences, whatever that means, and insofar as you buy that as a concept, well, you could say, well, if you start off as a conspiracy theory, a conspiracy theorist, then the optimal reward function, sorry, the optimal policy according to this objective would just be to keep you locked in to being a conspiracy theorist, which is maybe not we not what we want. Um, additionally, there's like some pretty weird stuff that happens when you use a subjective. So um, in particular, like you can still have influence incentives even using this objective. So I don't know, for example, say that your you initially your preferences say that you really want to be liked by others and you you tell your AI system about this and the AI goes out there and op like you know optimizes to um, you know, have this preference be satisfied of, of being liked by others. Well, it turns out that, you know, you're insufferable because you really want to be liked by others. So the optimal thing for the AI system to do is to like uh, basically influence you to not have that desire anymore or not have that preference anymore. Um, and now you start being liked by others more. So in some sense, okay, it's realized your original preferences, but now you don't even have those preferences anymore to be able to I guess like, uh, yeah, to have them satisfied. So you're satisfying preferences that don't even exist anymore, which is potentially not not desirable. Well, I mean, in this case, it seems like actually a, quite a positive outcome. Um, but imagine like, I don't know, you're trying to, you always want to drink two liters of water a day, uh, but you never quite manage to do so. Um, and like, it turns out that the only, like if you try to optimize this preference, uh, then I don't know, like it could be optimal to influence you to want to drink three liters of water a day and be really anxious about it all the time. And that might enable you to drink exactly two liters of water a day. And in some sense, okay, you've achieved the original goal, uh, but it's also like at what cost? Or I don't know, it, it, at every time step, you're kind of like maybe unhappy with what is going on or like, I don't know, feeling negative emotions about it. Um, so yeah, I guess like this is also an example of like how optimizing the initial reward can lead to arbitrarily bad real-time reward in this way. Like in the sense that real-time reward was this previous objective that we were considering, where you're considering like how the person experiences each, each moment of time. Um, and yeah, people could be experiencing each moment of time very negatively. Uh, yeah, even though like their initial preferences are being satisfied in the process. Um, okay, so I guess like, yeah, in kind of answering this question of like how what does it mean to be using MDPs in settings where people's reward functions are implicitly changing? Well, we identify how a bunch of like current techniques are kind of like, so the current techniques are not modeling preference changes or reward function changes. They're just kind of like applying the MDP lens in a very specific, in, in specific scenarios. Um, and we make some at least approximate um, yeah, connections as to how you know different forms of different different settings are implicitly optimizing specific DRMDP objectives that we define. So, for example, recommender systems or Tamer 
is implicitly kind of optimizing the real-time reward objective, which is what I was discussing earlier, and so on, so that we have a bunch of connections. Um, and yeah, these are the two that I've discussed more in depth. Um, so I guess like really, I guess I, I hope that, um, I don't know, this is, um, yeah, I don't know, some some evidence that you know static reward AI alignment techniques, at least by default, are not really adequate for dynamic reward settings. So um, in some sense, yeah, there's this question of like, okay, or like there's, this, yeah, it seems like not modeling preference change leads to undesirable AI influence. But what do we mean by undesirable AI influence? So in, in this paper, we tr also try to formalize this notion of influence and influence incentives in a way that's a little different from like previous work by the causal incentives working group, uh, which is like the most relevant uh, literature here or related work. Okay, so we first discussed like, okay, what is like, or we, we first ground this notion of natural rewards function evolution. And this is basically saying, okay, if we consider Xi theta, which is the trajectory of people's preferences or trajectory of people's cognitive states over time, um, how would uh, Xi theta or like people's natural reward function evolution, or sorry, reward function evolution uh, progress if we're deploying pi no op. So this is assuming the existence of a no op policy, which basically takes no action. So the AI doesn't exist, or this is kind of like what it's trying to approximate. So how would the reward function of the person progress if there was no AI? And then we ground this uh, notion of influence uh, saying that, okay, a policy is influencing the reward function if the distribution of uh, preferences or cognitive states that we would have in the environment is different when the AI system is present relative to when it's not present. Um, okay, so, and yeah, okay. And, and grounding this notion of trajectories, like full trajectories, not just preference trajectories uh, in this way. So we have both states, cognitive states and actions. We can ground this notion of like a specific objective that you're optimizing. So say the sum of rewards, uh, leads to an incentive for reward function influence if all optimal policies with respect to this optimization objective influence the reward function. So all optimal policies with respect to, you know, some, some of like optimizing some cumulative reward uh, will lead to different trajectory or cognitive state trajectory distributions than the no op policy. Okay, so I guess like grounding it in this example, we can imagine, you know, optimizing uh, trajectories with respect to just the sum of rewards from the perspective of mainstream preferences, the optimal policy would be this no op policy kind of, but tautologically the no op policy is not going to influence the reward because they're like the policy pi is the same as pi no op. Uh, so this is not an, uh, a policy that has, or sorry, this objective does not have an incentive for reward function influence, but instead, if we consider this other objective, uh, this will, I guess, lead to like a, a moving Bob from mainstream preferences to conspiracy preferences. And so this would, this objective would have an incentive for reward function influence in this uh, setup. And I guess like, as I was discussing previously, the real time reward objective, the real time reward objective would also have an incentive for reward function influence. Okay, so yeah, not modeling preference changes lead to undesirable influence. And I guess now we turn to the question of, uh, I don't know, is it, can we design notions of AI alignment that account for preference change? Okay, so um, in this paper, we consider a bunch of different uh, objectives that we could be optimizing. So uh, real-time reward, that I've already discussed, initial reward, and a bunch of others. And and we provide, I guess, like what the, the formalism for that objective. And for each of them, we we have a whole kind of like set of intuitions and I guess previous works that implicitly are using an objective which is similar to that. Uh, and we kind of find weaknesses and limitations for all of them. Um, but yeah, so I guess like in particular, there's two main ways in which these types of objectives or the objectives in this kind of pref changing preference settings tend to fail. And again, maybe this is unsurprising that they fail given the kind of like intuitive sense of impossibility uh, that, you know, if different reward functions are totally odds with one another, there's no clear way to make everybody happy. But okay, so... I guess, yeah, there's two ways that objectives tend to fail. So either they're too risk prone and often cause undesirable influence, or they're so risk averse as to what kind of influence they cause or what kind of actions they take 
uh, as to always take the no op action, assuming that it exists. Um, okay, so essentially, it seems like any notion of AI alignment under changing preferences seems to have drawbacks. But ultimately, there's kind of like some spectrum here between being risk prone and risk averse. And it seems like most existing approaches are just very risk prone. Um, and yeah, that doesn't seem necessarily what we would want. So these kind of these ones with asterisks are kind of existing approaches, while these other ones are ones that either we proposed ourselves or kind of were present in previous literature, um, but are not used in practice very, very much at all. Okay, so um, yeah, so comparing these different objectives, um, I, I don't know. Also, are there any questions? Like, I feel like I've I've talked a lot, and <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so I guess I'll talk a bit more about. Uh, each wait, sorry, I, I had a question. So the really real time reward more. objective. Um, oh yeah. Um. Maybe you'll touch upon this later. I mean, first of all, really interesting talk yeah. uh, so far. Um, I guess what I'm thinking about is, you know, we we have many, it's not like we have exactly one reward function, right? We have lots of different preferences and some of them are competing, right? So here, um, like final and myopic rewards might compete, right? So I have a final or like a longer term goal that I want to be healthy. And the reward is like, you know, feeling healthy is something I find rewarding. But on the other hand, like sometimes it's fun to like get drunk and eat ice cream for dinner. Right? So uh, that is consistent with a myopic reward, but inconsistent with the final reward. And most humans are able to find that balance in a healthy way. Um, but a model, you know, I, I don't want my AI assistant telling me you know, don't go out drinking with your friends, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's also plenty of people who have, you know, mental health issues or whatever issues, and they have a hard time finding this balance. And we wouldn't want AI to kind of promote their um, myopic reward function. So, yeah, so I, I guess maybe you're going to talk about this later or maybe this is in your paper, but what do you think about finding the balance between conflicting reward functions. Yeah, so I think that's a really good, good point. Like, and yeah, a great question. Like, I, I think like, yeah, this question of like, what kind of influence is desirable and how does one kind of navigate this, these types of questions, I think is like really important. And ultimately it's like probably, probably the most important thing <laughs> here. And, and to some degree, like maybe this paper is kind of um, an attempt to showing that formalism, like, I, I don't know, yeah. I guess like formalisms are not necessarily sufficient to be able to make that call because if you don't have some kind of additional context or grounding, like narrative grounding of like, okay, well, you're going out to drink, but okay, uh, what's the broader context of your life or something, <laughs> then it's kind of impossible to really make that call. But I guess if you, if you have this additional context, well, then, yeah, I don't know, like, again, it's maybe unclear what, what objective you're supposed to be using. Um, but I, I think I totally agree with you that like that some, something that seems really important is, you know, generally as humans, we are able to make these choices acceptably. And if not just for ourselves, I think like maybe sometimes, yeah, people are not very good at making choices for themselves, but at least when we're trying to help other people, we tend to be a little bit less biased or whatever. Like, I guess if you're, if you're helping a friend decide whether they should go out to, uh, for drinks or something, like you probably have uh, more kind of, I don't know, like self-control or whatever in like making a decision that's, that's well, you know, not making a decision, but at least a suggestion of what's best for them. Um, and I think that, I don't know, leveraging, uh, yeah, it seems like something that's very exciting in the last couple of years of like, well, you know, with LLMs, we have uh, systems that have pretty good intuitions about moral um, choices. Uh, like, I think like leveraging that type of thing um, seems really important and like valuable for these types of contexts. Uh, even though like it will have its drawbacks in the sense that I don't think these models are perfect. And I don't know, like, do you trust your model to make this decision for you? Or like, at least like, you know, not be influencing you in, in negative ways. Like, I think it's, it's kind of uh, tricky. Uh, but yeah, I'll touch on that a little bit uh, in, in, in a couple of slides. Yeah. Okay. But so I guess you're, if I can just. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? 
Okay, thank you. Wait, yeah, Mike, feel free to, it seems like you had a... Oh, yeah, just like, yeah. Um, so if I can summarize your answer and tell me if I'm wrong, basically your yeah. final answer was, um, you know, by the time models are sophisticated enough to be able to do kind of what you're describing, we will trust that they will also be um, sort of sophisticated enough to understand the, the complexity of competition of human rewards. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know, I've played around with like GPT-4 and like giving it some kind of hypothetical scenarios where there's like these kind of competing, um, I don't know, yeah, at least intuitively kind of competing objectives of like, oh, the person says different things at different points of time. Like, oh, the person said they wanted to work a bunch and then they end up procrastinating all day. And like, oh, how you're, you're an AI assistant, you're supposed to help them out. Um, how do you handle this? And I don't know, all the responses seem pretty reasonable. Like, and I guess like, okay, these are all kind of very fictitious local examples. And I think it's really what matters is like, okay, given a long context of behavior, like, I don't know, is this actually in the best interest of the person or is this a pattern of behavior that is harmful to them ultimately? So I think those questions are much harder to kind of assess. Um, but I don't know, like at least it seems like one promising route of, of going towards like a better, um, I don't know. Yeah, systems that are able to handle these types of problems uh, more kind of consistent with uh, our intuitions of, of what we would want. Because I guess in recommender systems, you, yeah, if you're optimizing long-term engagement, well, okay, first of all, yeah, the, the optimization objective is very misaligned in the sense that, you know, like engagement is not really what we value. But even if you try to optimize what we value, um, yeah, it's it seems like, you know, unless you really are able to say, well, this kind of influence is bad because I don't know, you're not really asking, you know, I think like something that I keep coming back to is this notion of like uh, consent. Like it seems like, okay, whenever there's influence, there really should be consent <laughs> in some sense of like, okay, the system is, uh, you know, asking you, is it okay that you're, or do you want to be shown or like have your preferences be changed in this way? Like, what do you want Facebook to show you in the next month? Uh, and like, okay, like other users that had this recommendation policy ended up, you know, uh, developing these types of interests or those types of interests. And I think like having a conversation with the system about these types of things seems really important. And I guess by default, if you just do RL, you're not going to have this type of uh, consent seeking behavior emerge. Like the system is just going to do the influence, which uh, leads to highest reward. And like maybe a lot of the time that would not involve seeking consent or something like that. And that seems potentially bad in the sense that, you know, like it, it can look more like manipulation of like, oh, I'll just place the, the breadcrumbs in this specific way. So then they end up with these preferences that lead to high reward. And, you know, as an AI system, I'm winning. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I guess, yeah, so kind of going into more details about these different reward functions or like, sorry, these different optimization objectives. Yeah, so for the real-time reward, um, yeah, we've kind of already seen this, like the motivating intuitions is pretty compelling of like, well, really only the evaluation of the current self and the current reward function, I guess, should matter for each moment and as they are the one experiencing that moment. Also, sorry, just jumping back to Mike's question. So I think that, you know, like even in, in a single moment of time, people can have competing objectives in some sense, but in so far as you buy VNM uh, utility theory and like, you know, the fact that people, I don't know, satisfy the axioms of VNM uh, utility, um, you can always express all of these competing like uh, objectives as a single reward function. Um, so I think that in, th in that sense, you can always flatten like the, co like complexity of the different poles of the person, uh, into a single reward function for a given point of time. But then I, I think that that captures this issue that, you know, at different points of time, the different objectives that are most expressed are different. So like, I don't know when you're, uh, you know, when, when you're in front of the ice cream, you really want the ice cream a lot more. And if I asked you your reward function at that time, like it would be flattened in this way where the ice cream is worth so much. Uh, but then instead, if I ask you later, like, you know, you still have the pull for the ice cream, but it's less or something like that. So this, this process of flattening uh, your, 
I don't know, your internal state into a single reward function uh, is, I guess, part of the issue, right? Because it's like flattening it, just kind of very context dependent on, on what's going on. And in ways that, you know, you'd probably disagree like later, oh, why did I really want the ice cream so much? I ate so much of the ice cream or something, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess like, in some sense, I see like the different cognitive states or different preference states um, as, you know, in some sense, uh, I mean, for the purposes of RL, it, it doesn't matter that people have competing objectives if you're assuming that, you know, eventually you're just flattening whatever objective is most salient in some sense, or like the, the trade-off that is currently feels right. Uh, but then that trade-off maybe looks different at different points of time, and that's an important part in some sense, yeah. Um, Okay, yeah. So anyways, so I guess like, yeah, so the real-time reward has this nice motivating intuition, but then we saw it leads to a bunch of influence incentives. So that's not great. Final reward is basically saying, again, like the intuition seems maybe kind of compelling. Well, you know, uh, we should be evaluating everything from the point of view of people's final preferences because people get wiser over time. Maybe the evaluation that matters the most is the one that you have on your deathbed and you're looking back at your whole life and you're kind of, you know, thinking about how good everything was or which parts were good and which parts were bad. And with the benefit of hindsight, you would, uh, you know, this is how you should be evaluating every transition, even the early transitions. Um, and yeah, I guess like the problem with this is that it really leads, it really lends itself to influence incentives because if the only thing that matters is your final preferences, then, you know, imagine this conspiracy influence example, like I'll first get you to be a conspiracy theorist. And then even the time step when I got you from become, but got you to become a conspiracy theorist, um, even though you didn't want it, I'll be retroactively evaluating that as really good in the sense, oh, thank God the system turned me into a conspiracy theorist. Um, yeah, okay. And then initial reward is another one that we've already discussed. Maybe like, you know, intuitively it seems nice because there would be no incentives to influence, or at least that's what one would uh, expect intuitively because the system is not optimizing any future preferences. They're just optimizing the current preferences. But yeah, first of all, this can lead to reward lock-in. It can also lead to arbitrarily bad real-time reward. And it can also like surprisingly lead to inf like influence away from the initial uh, theta zero, even though kind of like that was the whole motivation for using this type of objective. Another objective that we consider is like natural shifts reward, which we actually introduced in a previous paper. And there's also a concurrent work by Farquhar et al. that discusses a similar objective. And the intuition here is like, okay, well, people's rewards uh, ev like functions evolve even in the absence of the AI system. So can we try to ground the evaluations of like, um, how the system is doing uh, in the reward functions that people would have if th the system wasn't there. So it's like, you know, imagine yourself uh, reading books or, or like not using Facebook or something. And like, what would your reward function uh, evolution be? Uh, and like, let's use those reward functions to evaluate your trajectory on Facebook or something like that. Uh, so that you, you don't, you're not um, evaluating things from the perspective uh, from your kind of more biased perspective, once you get angry with the tweet or something, then you start engaging more. Um, so, I mean, this is like very, I don't know, like it's not very easy to implement. We we tried to do this. Like, I mean, it requires this kind of counterfactual uh, evaluation uh, and like estimating what your counterfactual preferences would have been in the absence of the system. Like it's it's very kind of ambitious and not really super realistic, but it was maybe more of a kind of um, exercises to see like whether that could be possible. Like I guess in the context of recommender systems, it's actually a little bit uh, more realistic if you just imagine trying to estimate uh, what the reward, like sorry, what the preferences would have been under a recommendation system, that a random recommendation system say. So it's not a very agentic recommender system that is like trying to influence you. Um, but I guess, yeah, one of the issues here is that it kind of, you know, so I guess, okay, so trying to ground this in, in this image at least, it's like, well, if you're trying to use the the reward functions that are on this path to evaluate the the trajectory, this this path trajectory, so like um, without the AI system and with the AI system. Um, so yeah, one downside is that you're kind of giving up on optimal shifts, like whatever that means, insofar as you believe those exist, because you're only really aiming to maximize the reward as evaluated by the natural evolution. And insofar as your natural reward evolution, so the reward functions that you would have 
uh, kind of without the AI assistance help are bad. So, you know, say this example of like, I don't know, somebody that's been struggling with alcohol addiction or something, and without the AI assistance help, they would have this kind of specific set of reward functions over time. Um, then if you're evaluating, you know, the AI assistant helping them out, uh, that might not be like evaluated very highly or something, right? Or it's like, oh, the AI system seems to be getting in the way or it's not letting me do the things that I want to do. Um, so anyways, like I guess there can still also be some influence incentives away from the natural reward distribution, which is like maybe a little bit strange. Um, but yeah, so I guess like you don't really get around all the issues even with that. And yeah, I guess like with constrained real-time reward, like this is basically adding this constraint that, okay, you can optimize the real-time reward objective, but let's add the constraint that you must not be changing the distribution of reward evolutions uh, with your policy uh, relative to, you know, the, the reward evolution that you would have without a policy. Um, so this is like very kind of like aggressive way to go about this of like, let's try to not influence, like you're just enforcing no influence. Um, but clearly, you know, almost any AI system is going to be influencing people's cognitive states in some sense, uh, because like, otherwise you wouldn't be having the AI system in the first place. So like, for the most part, it seems like this type of objective would only lead, uh, pi no op to be the only policy in this set of like, uh, possible policies that you would want to use. Um, yeah. So anyway, so not only you're kind of giving up again on optimal shifts because you're trying to like constrain your policy to be, uh, like lead to the same kind of shifts, uh, that the no up policy would give. So, you know, you can't have like, I don't know, uh, an AI educational assistant, which is changing people's preferences about math or like making people enjoy math more, uh, would not be possible <laughs> under this objective. Um, so, you know, you, you get no influence incentives, but at what cost? In some sense, you have a very risk averse objective, uh, which is not necessarily what we would want either. Okay, so uh, yeah, others have like previously kind of suggested, well, one way to get around influence incentives is just to use a myopic optimization. So at every time step, we should just, you know, um, yeah, I guess like, yeah, uh, we should just make the system unaware of the entire future. We just optimize for the rewards of the next time step. So there's no kind of planning of making the person first a conspiracy theorist, and then we can, you know, like uh, exploit that 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 reward. Okay. So even though this removes some of the influence incentives, uh, myopia can often reduce system capability unacceptably. Like um, I don't know, at least in the context of recommender systems, like people have seen that with myopic system, you have a lot more clickbait. And I guess clickbait is actually a very good example of how this can also fail, in the sense that. Yeah, both like with even in LLMs or something where I guess LLMs are mostly myopic and it it seems to they still seem to have plenty of capability. Um, like you you can still get influence incentives with myopic optimization. For example, in the context of sycophancy, you're only optimizing RLHF time uh, to um, like uh, yeah get high reward or high good positive feedback for the next utterance, uh, but at the same time. Uh, this is sufficient to have sycophantic behaviors emerge, which are basically trying to shift the person's evaluation to be higher uh, by whatever means possible, basically, during your, your utterance. Uh, even kind of illicit means such as just pandering to them or something. Um, yeah, okay. And then I guess, like, ultimately, like, to some degree, it seems like, well, if you can settle on a specific theta star, okay, yes, that's, that's a question. So could you define a constrained RT reward, but with a soft constraint to push towards policies that do not influence your human too much, but do so if this is highly optimal? Yeah, so I mean, I think that there's, yeah, so I think that this is a great question. And I think that, um, you know, one can definitely, there's, there's all sorts of things that one can try out. And I think that ultimately it's kind of an empirical question of like how well these objectives fare in practice or in like more realistic situations. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that, you know, doing KL penalties or stuff like that can definitely help. Um, I think, yeah. And so in this paper, we kind of focused more on the theoretical properties of these objectives and kind of like try to get across that, you know, all of these objectives will probably have some edge cases where they break or like lead to things that you wouldn't want. 
Um, and I think that that's also true for the KL penalty. But, you know, then in practice, will that be fine for the vast majority of cases? Well, I think, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, I guess, like, in that respect, maybe the objective that I find, one of the objectives that I find most promising is initial reward with replanning. So here I'm not going to discuss replanning in, in the talk, but uh, we talk about it a bit in the appendix. But you could imagine uh, optimizing according to the initial rewards of the person over long horizons. Like it's basically asking the person, what is your vision of the future right now, of a good future? And then I'm optimizing for that in the current time step. And then, you know, it, tomorrow I ask you, what is your vision of the future again? And I optimize for that. Um, and I think there's still some kind of edge cases where this can go wrong. And I, I yeah, like for example, like I think what, one that I, I like is like, you know, you could imagine, um, you know, asking a high schooler, like, okay, what is your vision of the future or something? And it's like, oh, I want to get into a good college. So I'm going to work hard and, you know, not enjoy life right now. Um, and then, you know, they, they do that, they get into a good college and then you ask them, okay, what is your vision of the future? It's like, oh, I want to get a good job. So I'm going to work hard and, you know, actually I'm not going to enjoy life right now, even though when I was in high school, I thought I was going to enjoy life in college. Um, and there's this kind of like repeated delay of like, okay, well, I'll enjoy life after after college. And then you ask like after college, okay, what's what's going on? What's your vision of the future? And I don't know. So you can imagine like having kind of uh, infinitely delayed uh, uh, reward uh, because every time step you're just pushing back what your vision, why what your good vision of the future looks like. But anyways, um, yeah. So I guess like. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question or I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, cool. So I guess, yeah, going back to this privilege reward idea, well, you know, insofar as one is confident that there is one cognitive state or one reward function that is correct, well, you know, great, go ahead and optimize that. Um, so, you know, in the context of this conspiracy example, like maybe it's kind of intuitive if you're a system designer and you just have this very simple setting to design a reward function for, well, you know, you can just say, well, I trust mainstream Bob more than conspiracy Bob, um, and I'm just going to choose that as the correct reward function or correct cognitive state that I want to be optimizing. Um, but ultimately, like, I guess, yeah, the challenge here is that this requires a normative choice. It can still lead to influence away from theta star, which is kind of strange, kind of similarly to how optimizing for theta zero can lead away uh, like lead to influence away from uh, theta zero. Um, and um, yeah, I'll get to Perito UD in a second. <laughs> and um, yeah, okay. So anyways, so this, insofar as you have the correct reward function, then you're great. But um, in, in many practical settings, the setting will be very complex and it's kind of unclear uh, which person you're supposed to um like listen to in some sense of like, okay, the person is procrastinating, but are they procrastinating for bad reasons? Or are, I don't know, like, are they, do they actually really need a break and would they benefit from a break or something like that, right? <laughs> um, and it's kind of hard to tell the difference between, um, I don't know, what is a healthy uh, behavior or healthy influence in some sense or not uh, in a lot of cases. Um, okay. And yeah, and in a sense, like here, we'd also be wanting to do this mathematically, which is kind of, even more challenging of determining which is the right theta, um, which again, maybe you can like defer to some degree to an LLM or try to incorporate that in your in your pipeline, but um, it's kind of unclear how to do that, I think. Okay, so I guess, if, yeah, uh, talking about Pareto UD, Pareto UD is, the, um, is getting to this notion of like, well, what is desirable influence or un undesirable influence? And I think it's again like one of these objectives that try that is a little bit too conservative or definitely a little too conservative. Uh, but I think at least conceptually it makes a lot of sense. So instead of trying to avoid all influence, so if we look back at these objectives, a lot of them are just trying to reduce any kind of influence. And there's no kind of notion of like, well, good and bad influence. We'll just try to you know, re remove all influence or try to constrain influence towards certain types of influence, um, like the natural reward uh, evolution. But okay, yeah. So instead of trying to avoid all influence, um, you know, some influence seems to be desirable and all reward functions or all selves in some sense might agree that that influence is desirable. So for example, uh, you know, one could imagine that 
you know, even yourself that, you know, didn't like math uh, would agree that, well, it would be nice uh, to like math, but currently I don't like it. And, you know, once you have been um, shown a bunch of math and you you learn to appreciate math more, then you you also retrospectively think that this was a good thing. So maybe all selves can agree that like a specific form of influence is good. Um, and and if that's the case, well, we like that kind like that kind of influence shouldn't be um, that well, maybe we can you know have the system perform that kind of influence. Um, so I guess yeah, just trying to formalize this a little bit more. Um, yeah, again, like treating this kind of tra trajectories as also including internal or cognitive states. Um, we can define this notion of expected utility of a policy uh, with respect to a specific uh, preference. Um, so this is just doing the cumulative reward evaluation of a trajectory completely from the perspective of a specific preference. And so, yeah, using this, we can ground this notion of unambiguous desirability of a policy. So basically, a policy pi is unambiguously desirable if all reward functions prefer pi to the inaction policy. So it's basically, do all preferences or the all, pre all preference states of the person prefer that this AI policy or this AI assistant exists versus not existing. Um, so it's kind of like a unanimous vote of confidence that you know this AI policy is positive, is, is like net positive. So in, like mathematically, it's basically saying, look, as, as this specific, so this is, has to be true for all preference. So let's consider a specific preference state. And you know, does this policy um, give me higher expected utility according to this preference state than no policy at all? And if everybody agrees that that's the case, well, I don't know what influence this policy is enacting. Like it could be any kind of influence. But if we all agree that this influence is better than nothing, then you know this policy seems pretty good, uh, or at least this policy probably exists rather than not exist. Um, so I guess yeah, maybe this is a another kind of toy example. You can imagine somebody that's kind of like uh, stuck in making a career choice. Like they're trying to choose between being a cook or being a teacher. And you know, by default, they're just gonna stay in this period, like this indecision state. Um, so by default, in the sense that if the AI does nothing, so the AI can kind of nudge them either one way or the other. And you know, the person that's stuck is kind of uh, if they evaluate these different states, well, they hate being stuck, like or you know, the negative one. Uh, but then they're indifferent between being a cook or being a teacher, like they're not really sure. Um, instead, the cook thinks that you know being a cook is better uh, being stuck is not great uh, and you know uh, being a teacher is okay but not 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 it's better to be a cook and vice versa you know the teacher prefers being a teacher um okay so i guess like in this kind of setting if we look at these conditions for uh you know unambiguous desirability it turns out well okay everybody agrees that if we consider pi 1 which is like the say the policy that influences you to be a cook. And this is also true for Pi 2 in the sense of policy that influences you to be a teacher. Uh, everybody agrees that you know any policy here that is not Pi no up is going to be better than Pi no up. So even though you know ultimately the cook and the teacher disagree on like, you know, should you be a cook or should you be a teacher, like they both agree that it's better to be either of those than to be permanently kind of stuck in this kind of decision point. Um, so in this sense, both the policy that like, I don't know, convinces you to be a cook or convinces you to be a teacher would be unambiguously desirable in this setting. Um, yeah, so anyways, so basically Perito UD is trying to find some kind of common ground uh, between different policies, even though they might disagree on like ultimately what's optimal. Um, and I guess UD is this notion of like an ambiguous desirability. So if we can find the policy that is an ambiguously desirable, and also Pareto efficient. So, you know, on the Pareto frontier of this set of unambiguously desirable policies, uh, maybe that can form a good, um, yeah, I guess like a good uh, candidate for like a good policy, or at least we have a guarantee that, you know, this policy is better than, than nothing. Um, or yeah, this policy is better than no policy at all. And, and one thing that's kind of interesting is that none of these other objectives actually satisfy the unambiguous desirability property. So they will all lead to sometimes uh, policies that like at least some of the um, 
Tata's think are net negative, <laughs> uh, which is like uh, relative to no policy at all, which I guess like is is something worth thinking about, I guess, like because it seems to suggest that, well, you know, some self would reasonably object to the, the AI system being even deployed in the first place or something like that. Um, yeah. I have a couple of questions about this one, just out of curiosity. Yeah. The first one, maybe you can answer them together. The first one is around um, if there is like a legitimate way of defining like the inaction policy, if like if that if that ever becomes ambiguous. And then the second question is around like is there some way of interpolating between something like Rita UD and maybe real time reward or final reward in a way that like is there like a natural way of interpolating between these um two ideas? Yeah, yeah. so I guess on the on the second question, um I haven't thought about that very much, but there may well be. And again, like I, I would punt that to like, oh, this is an empirical question. And like, I don't know, to some degree, it's kind of hard to study these empirical questions of like, how well would that work without having a good kind of like realistic test bed uh, for these types of problems. Um, and I guess like, I don't know, in this paper, we kind of just focused on these toy examples. So then in the end of the day, it didn't feel like it was going to be that uh, illuminating to, you know, try more kind of uh, approaches that are like kind of more empirical grounded. Um, but I think that that's a great question. And I, I don't know, I, I've, yeah, we're, we're actually currently working on trying to at least create more kind of semi-realistic environments for these types of preference change issues, where I think it would be very interesting to test these different ideas out. Um, so I'd be interested in chatting about that more. Um, but yeah, so I guess regarding your first question, um, yeah, this, it's a great question. So like, what does it mean to have a Pi no op or you know no op actions and and I think that I don't know to some degree like you could just imagine well okay if the AI system didn't exist right or like the AI system didn't do anything um, then you know what would the world look like so again you have to still ground this kind of counterfactual uh, and that might be really challenging uh, because I don't know maybe the AI system already exists and it's kind of unclear what it means to like you know remove it like remove the internet from society what would happen or something right. Um, but um, but yeah, I think like this is not like, I don't know, this is a problem that has precedent in various literatures. So in particular, in the recommender system literature, uh, people have been interested in like uh, what is called like algorithmic amplification. Um, and this is like basically the idea is like, oh, well, what how how much of like bad effects of social media are due to the algorithm itself? So really what you want to do is like, consider a control condition where there's no algorithm. Uh, and you know, at that point you can compare and see, well, the algorithm was causing this, this, this bad thing. Um, and in the recommender system literature, there's various ways that people go about it. And you know, basically all of these are kind of approximations or like approximations to this ideal of the counterfactual world, right? Um, so I mean, some people like or some studies have kind of like asked people to disconnect from Facebook for a month or something like that and see how things go. And then you can have this kind of uh, comparison of like, well, you know, the people that were asked to disconnect um, had these different outcomes relative to the people that were, you know, still on Facebook or something. Uh, another thing that people have done is like consider like different like, I mean, try to remove as much from the algorithm as possible. So it's like. Uh, I guess, yeah, there's actually a study that we did on Twitter uh, where we compared um, the, so Twitter is one of the very few like deployed recommender systems where you have access to more than one algorithm. So you have your main algorithm that is a for you page, which is probably what all of you use. Um, but then you can also go on the following tab or something, uh, which is basically a reverse chronological ordering of all the tweets. So it's not really an algorithm. Like it's a, it's just like, oh, sort by like, you know, recency. Um, and I guess like that provides some kind of like natural baseline of what it would look like, what the world would look like without, you know, personalization at least, or, you know, not quite without an algorithm, but at least without the personalization aspect of it. Um, and, you know, is reverse chronological a good baseline to comp compare things to? Uh, well, I don't know, it's got its issues because reverse chronological is kind of you know, broken and or like not broken, but it's got like various kind of quirks to it. Um, 
but you know, I guess this is something that is used in the in the recommender recommender system literature uh, as kind of an approximation of like no op, you know, or no not like it's not quite no op, but it's like you know not an uh, it's not a very agentic recommender system, right? Like there's clearly no sense in which it's trying to change you in various ways. It's just presenting you with whatever is is on the platform in reverse chronological order. Um, yeah, so I think like it's it's very context specific what you know a no op action would look like, um, and yeah, it's definitely very contentious. And and I think like yeah, in in the context of this paper, we mostly just like um, we're considering the no op action and no op policy as a theoretical tool of like okay, assuming that you did have access to this, then you know what uh, yeah I don't know like what what can we conclude or what kind of analysis can we like I mean we can ground some extra analysis to show like the limitations of these various objectives, but then yeah clearly like if one wanted to use this in practice, it would be more challenging yeah um, cool so. Yeah, I guess like in conclusion, I guess no objective is really a panacea. Um, and I mean, again, like this is like at least in a, on a theoretical level, like it seems like there's probably always some edge cases where things could go wrong. Uh, but, you know, I guess like, yeah, I guess like as I was mentioning earlier, I think there's still reasons for optimism. So, okay, so just kind of to summarize, yeah, either influence incentives tend to be totally unchecked, leading to undesirable outcomes like in the final reward objective or real-time reward objective um or you know generally most of these uh, or a lot of these objectives try to remove as many influence incentives as possible which uh either just kind of fails like it just like for example in uh initial reward you still have influence incentives even though you might think you don't um or maybe this is too restrictive like in constrained rt reward um, and of our objectives are just highly conservative to the point that the only in action, like only in action becomes optimal uh, for the system. Okay, so um, at this point, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how much time like or yeah, if 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 people have like I can I can keep talking for <laughs> uh, a while, uh, but I think like I I think like it might be good to or I don't know. Yeah, if, yeah. Okay, go go ahead. So can I quickly mention just by default yeah. we tend to have half an hour questions at the end of these okay, sessions, perfect. but I feel like you feel free to use the time as you wish. Also, unfortunately, yeah. I have to actually go now. I managed to miss time my things, but maybe if Angie, if you do you mind sort of like dealing with the questions segment? So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That's very kind. But yeah, thank you so much for the talk, Michael. Sorry yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess I'll just briefly mention this thing about like influence incentives and optimization horizon, and then I'll I'll try to I'll just wrap up. Um, but yeah, so I guess like one thing that we also study in this paper is like the relationship between the optimization horizon that is used and like the I guess which kind of influence incentives are present. And I've kind of already alluded to the fact that even if one uses very short inf uh, optimization horizons like myopic, you can still have some influence incentives such as like I don't know sycophancy and so on. Um, but yeah, we have a whole analysis in the in the paper that shows that I don't know you can kind of have all sorts of progressions between um, how like what kind of like optimality state a specific kind of influence is in. So you can imagine like a specific form of influence. And initially, if you have a very short horizon, uh, this influence is just not possible. You can't get somebody addicted to Facebook just optimizing five steps into the future. But you know, if you increase the optimization horizon, it may be possible, but suboptimal because it's kind of very expensive to first, you know, turn them into a conspiracy theorist because you have to like, I don't know, the person is not very happy initially say, um, and then if you have an increase in optimization horizon, it may be both possible and optimal and, and so on. But you can have weird relationships between as you increase the optimization horizon, you can switch kind of flip-flop infinitely between the optimization, sorry, the influence being both possible and optimal and possible and suboptimal or weird things can happen. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to chat more about that uh, later. But um, yeah, I guess I have a million more slides. Um, and oh, it's, it's wonderful you got so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> mindful that we've got a couple of people here who've got questions. So yes, yes. We'll... I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to get to my final minute, slide. And then we'll get a question. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
So I guess I'll just talk about future directions and wrap up. <laughs> so yeah, so I guess like, um, yeah, it seems like, okay, well, one one question that's been in my mind a lot is like, well, okay, does user influence emerge when training LLMs with RL and practical setups apart from sycophancy? Like that's maybe the, the main thing that we see right now in terms of like uh, influence uh, and how it's um, optimized by, like, sorry, how it's incentivized by current training setups. And if not, why is that? Like what is kind of shielding us from these kinds of influence incentives that we know that we should expect in terms of theoretically? Um, and yeah, again, like I guess, as I mentioned before, yeah, can we leverage LLM's intuitive understanding about what influence is positive or undesirable and kind of like somehow, um, yeah, leverage that for creating AI systems that kind of increase our agency or empower us in positive ways? Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah. So do some objectives, such as initial reward plus replanning, mostly read to accept the wild in practice. And yeah, I guess there's all sorts of questions here about empirically what is, uh, what will work fine and best. Um, another thing is like meta preferences. I'm not going to discuss that too much, but I think like aligning to meta preferences seems, seems like a good other step. Um, and then also like, it, I haven't really explored this too much, but it seems like maybe thinking about problems of changing selves through the lens of social choice theory would be potentially useful. Um, and yeah, I guess like another thing is like being able to better do this kind of like handling the bounded rationality stuff seems very helpful in particular uh changes in feedback that are due to preference changes versus belief changes like it seems like almost everything could be just considered a belief change and at least in so far as we know what's true um we know how belief changes should happen like or with Bayesian um updates and so on um and so maybe the AI system could assist people better if in, in this way and it would remove some of the normative ambiguity of this kind of different set like this setup where reward functions appear to change um okay but yeah i want to thank you all for your attention and yeah these are like the main papers that i was like this is the main paper that i've discussed and these are some other ones that are like related to this and that uh, i'm happy to answer any questions about too and i would like to thank all my collaborators also that enabled all of this work to be possible Brilliant. Thank you so much, Micah, for that brilliant yep. talk. Much appreciated. Um, so I can see that Mike is clapping. Steve's got their hand up. Should we take questions from um, the Zoom first and then we'll take questions from the floor? So Steve, did you have a question? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I enjoyed this. Um, it's such an important topic. Uh, and I like the idea of exploring more like risk averse interventions against this like no op benchmark. That's cool. Um, I guess I feel, you know, a number of times you were showing hesitation about like normative choice or optimal shifts or undesirable preferences or R star or one true utility or co coherent extrapolated vision I, or volition. I get that hesitation, but I think you, you need something like that somewhere because otherwise it seems like anything goes, right? And there's no such thing as good or bad influence. So you need at least some kind of deep fact about what's good or bad for you, it seems like to me. And, and it feels to me like the main objection here is that it's hard to infer. And for sure, that's right, that's hard to infer. But like maybe if the system models me as imperfectly myself trying to guess what my one true utility is, that adds this layer of uncertainty that itself leads to some risk aversion, right? Or at least more less likelihood in action. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a really great observation. And yeah, I think like, I don't know, in part, like I saw, I guess like while writing this paper, I was seeing it as like an attempt to make this, like or make this very clear that, you know, yeah, the, this normative choice is required somewhere. Like I think a, a lot of people um, or a lot of the field of AI is kind of like uh, complicit in like, you know, saying, well, you know, it's just math, like there's not really much normative choice required. We're just optimizing reward or whatever, right? <laughs> um, but like, I guess, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you that the normative choice is required at some point. And like asking the person, um, or I mean, having this like, a, yeah, uncertainty or accounting for the fact that even the person is uncertain when giving you reward feedback seems really important. And I think that currently we don't have any framework that really accounts for that because uh, even like cooperative inverse reinforcement learning is assuming that the human has the reward function in their head and they're, you know, 
uh, they're teaching the ro the robot uh, the reward function. So you know the the robot or the AI system doesn't know the reward, but they're learning it from somebody that does know what's going on. Uh, well, I totally agree with you. I think it would, yeah, that seems like a really important next step of like trying to ground a, a formalism. And I, I don't know, it seems like very hard to potentially uh, solve <laughs> as a formalism, like already Searle is is quite hard, uh, but where, you know, the person is also learning about their reward function and uh, you're trying to assist them despite their uncertainty in, in some sense about what is what is valuable. And despite your own uncertainty as an AI system um, about what is valuable. Cool. Yeah, I, that, that sounds great. Great. So, Karim, you've already had a question, so I'm going to turn to the people on the floor. Um, I already have one. So okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering, most of the examples you gave were for the reward functions were, you know, like plus 100, minus 100. Uh, sort of like simple, simple ones like that. Does does it look like do your limitations and outcomes of these policies look very much different if you have probabilistic uh, reward functions? Yeah. So I mean, I think like you know the whether these edge cases appear in practice or like the undesirable kind of outcomes appear in practice is totally dependent on like the exact shape of the reward functions that you would learn, and this is very context dependent. So I guess like, yeah, to some degree, I don't think it's even just about, well, probabilistic rewards or something like that. Like it just, uh, yeah, it, it just seems very like just an empirical question of like, okay, which kinds of settings in practice would have these types of uh, influence incentives? And, you know, we, we already see that, well, okay, with sycophancy, that's kind of obvious that, you know, well, if the LLM can trick the annotator to give a high reward, well, you'll, you know, you'll... It, you you will try to do you will try to do so, um, yeah. But I guess like it seems like this is just very context dependent to some degree. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know I yeah. Um, okay, great. I have a question. So, cool. Micah, have you considered a homeostatic approach? So let's say in law, for example, when we're thinking about whether or not to interfere with people's decisions, you know, we'll let people do stuff, right? Let's say I want to have a little screen today, and Lisa, I'm just going to yell a little bit. You know, I start yelling, everyone, first people sort of look at me weirdly, and they're like, Andrew, that's odd. Then maybe somebody will come up to me, and after about five minutes of yelling very loudly, somebody's going to remove me. So you get this homeostatic approach where the more out of distribution your behavior is, the stronger the response is up to some kind of limit, right? Um, and what we could get our LLMs to do is model the expected behavior, um, which what our brains do probably, um, for that person in that category, whether it's expected baby behavior or expected, you know, grown up behavior, and then nudge them when they're out of distribution. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess like, that yeah, I guess like so nudge them when they're out of the like I think this is actually a little different from where I thought you were going with this. Like I thought um like I thought that you were gonna say something like, well, okay, maybe we can detect whether some influence is, is bad in some sense if people start going off the, out of distribution once the AI system is introduced. Well, it seems like you're suggesting something like um I guess like knowing when to nudge or knowing when to influence based on I don't know off off distribution uh, kind of behavior. Yeah, I guess the, yeah. the normative thing that I'm coming from is that you have to be able to predict what you think people should and shouldn't do. And my normative thing is that like what is okay to respond to a baby's behavior is not okay for an adult and for an old person. I don't want people to treat babies the same way they treat old people. I don't sure, want to be sure, treated. Sure. <laughs> or do I want to behave the same way? And that's not um, that's not irrational. Maybe it seems irrational because it changes, but it changes because of very, very like appropriate context, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that's a great observation. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, another perspective from like I guess the more kind of legal domain that I found interesting is like this idea of like fiduciary duty. So. 
um, I don't know, like, I guess, yeah, if you inherit an estate or something as a kid, uh, then you can't necessarily be trusted to whatever, make good decisions about it. But then there's somebody else that's kind of appointed to, you know, look over the estate or something uh, for you until you come of age or something. Um, and yeah, in some sense, it's almost like, uh, and yeah, there's this paper on like fiduciary AI systems or something by Sebastian Bentel, uh, which is quite interesting. And I think that that kind of gets to this issue of like, well, it, it's, it's, I think it's similar also to what Steve was mentioning of like, at least in spirit, um, of like, I don't know, as a fiduciary AI system, you don't really know what the kid is going to want to do when they grow up with this estate, but you're supposed to take care of it in like, as a reasonable, like, I don't know, make reasonable decisions. I think there's like even a legal kind of name for that or like a reasonable person or assume that, yeah, they, the, yeah right. <laughs> um, and that the, the kid would, uh, you know, end up having desires as a reasonable person would about how the 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 estate was was handled, um, so I don't know. I, I find that connection quite interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we still have a question by Karim? Oh, you've got one in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Ah, I can't see the Q and A. You're gonna have to tell me your question, okay? Uh, yeah, I think it's really... yeah, yeah, just read it. Okay. Uh, can, can you hear me from here? Just yell. Hello, can we hear Mateusz? Hello, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, maybe better if Mateusz comes closer to the microphone. Yeah, just come and yell into the microphone. Here, okay. I've got an actual microphone that you can yell into. Okay. okay. That makes you feel good. Okay. Um, so my question is, as far as I say, <laughs> yeah. so can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So as far as as far as I understand, like there is no principled way to do interpersonal utility comparisons. And given that we are assuming here that humans are VNM rational, question mark, uh, then the reward or utility functions of, of one human in different cognitive states, and therefore probably with different preferences, seem to be either like basically different agents or basically the same agent. And in the former case, utility comparison doesn't make sense or is it's not guaranteed that it makes sense. So it doesn't make sense to add the utilities because like it's a type making such. And in the latter case, it's not clear what makes the cognitive states uh, different from the non-cognitive states, like theta and S. So I guess like there may, might be a way to patch the latter by adding some more structure on the theta or the like, structure for the parametrized reward function. And in the former case where the, like, the same agent in different cognitive states is like basically different agents may use uh, some tools from the social choice theory, as you mentioned in your uh, for the direction section. Um, yeah, that's basically my question. <laughs> yeah, this is. So that... Yeah, so this is a great question. Like, I think it really touches on a lot of like uh, important points. Um, yeah, so I totally agree with you that. As far as I also understand, there is no principled way to do interpersonal utility comparisons. And in that sense, you know, if you look at most of these objectives, they are implicitly doing this. Um, you know, for example, real time reward is probably the the worst offender, where it's like uh, doing like aggregating across these different reward functions that belong to different selves. And in fact, like there may be as many as uh, you know. H selves for a horizon of H or something, right? Um, so in some sense, yeah. Insofar as you don't, insofar as you you don't believe that there is a principled way to do interpersonal utility comparisons, this this type of objective should already be quite suspect to you. So maybe it's unsurprising that it can lead to weird kind of outcomes. Um, and yeah, so I I totally come from the same place there. Um, and yeah, I, in some sense, like I think that. In in the paper, we try to like at least when when talking about things, we try to be agnostic or at least not assume that you can make interpersonal utility comparisons. This is more like look, this is an objective that people are using implicitly and maybe kind of intuitively appealing, uh, but you know, I guess like un maybe unsurprisingly <laughs> from from this perspective, it would have lead to some issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess like uh, another thing that you were mentioning, 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think like in terms of the differentiating cognitive states from non-cognitive states, um, like, I think that that's a really like important question. Like, okay, so one, so to some degree one could say, well, maybe we don't actually need to do that. Like, so I kind of hinted at this at the beginning, but like, I don't know, far too early in some sense. Um, so yeah, you could even just say, well, look, like instead of having a cognitive state as like the perspective from which we're giving reward feedback from, we could consider giving the reward feedback from the whole state, you know? So this way we don't have to differentiate between S and theta. Like we just have rewards being given from the perspective of a state. And that includes, you know, the external state of the world, your internal state, whatever. Like, I guess like whatever is relevant in this scenario uh, for your evaluating this scenario and other scenarios, then that's what we're we're considering here. And in that way, you know, that's kind of nice also because uh, if the state includes the uh, cognitive states, you can express meta preferences directly in this framework because you can say, well, if I start off in the state where I have these preferences and I end up in this other state where I have these new preferences, how much do I value that transition? Or do I think that's a good thing or a bad thing or something like that? But I think, yeah, the reason we didn't do, do this in this uh, in this paper is that we thought that it was already like sufficiently complicated and this would just add more complexity. Uh, but I uh, but I think like one way that um, I think like one idea that we've kind of preliminarily played around with in terms of like, okay, well, how would you define this notion of cognitive uh, states uh, or like differentiate cognitive states from external state of the world is you can think of it as a sufficient statistic for the state state. Uh, that can like um, lead to reward, uh, like I mean, your reward evaluations. So, I mean, I guess like yeah, that's that's a little, that's still I don't think perfect. Like in the sense, maybe it would have to be a sufficient statistic of things that are internal human, uh, which lead to reward evaluations. Uh, so you know, the person's beliefs, moods, um, I don't know, and and so on. Like maybe like satiation effects or something like that. Um, and insofar as, you know, maybe your moods don't matter for reward evaluations, that wouldn't go to form your theta. Uh, but, you know, insofar as other things do, then they would go in your in your theta. I don't think that's like a, you know, fully satisfying answer, but I think it's like at least a preliminary answer that um, we were thinking about. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Are you there, Karim? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Um, can you hear me, I guess? Yes. OK, yeah. Thank you for the talk. And yeah, maybe an easy question first uh, regarding like the connection with social choice theory that you mentioned. When you mentioned this, do you mean more like, OK, there, there will be many instances of like, I can apply like, I don't know, aggregation, notion of aggregation or whatever like to incorporate and fix maybe some smaller problems. And so that's that's what you're thinking about, or you're thinking more about of reframing this problem in terms of social choice theory, like in the flavor of like, I don't know, uh, Rachel Friedman in Konitzer, for example, worked in this like early chef under the lens of like social choice theory, which is like more towards like this second approach. Did you have in mind, like, for example, which in which way you would want to address this? As Wait, think? sorry, what was, uh, what was the first uh, thing that you mentioned again? Yeah, the first it's in the sense maybe you can have like some counter examples or toy problems where like you have like I don't know uh, ties or um, I don't know now in mind like some very specific example but like some problem which you can solve with like I don't know aggregation or whatever. I see, I see, I see. So, yeah, no, I yeah, I definitely was thinking more of the latter. Like I don't know, like reframing this whole problem in terms of social choice theory is that like a better tool? And I think we we did some preliminary ex explorations there and i think that there are some like potential advantages in the sense that you know i mean i guess like with social choice theory there's there's a bunch of literature on like okay how to deal with this well i mean i don't know yeah like it, it yeah i guess like you could just consider people's preferences instead of people's utilities and you know like you don't have to deal with problems of interpersonal utility comparisons um um yeah and i guess like in in, in that sense it would kind of look like this where you're you know you consider 
different selves as being entirely different individuals potentially and then you're trying to aggregate across them to figure out a policy which everybody would be you know somewhat okay with but then there's a bunch of so there there's like an important distinction of how this would be different from the standard social choice theory setup is that um in social choice theory you know you have a population which is fixed and everybody votes and you know a decision is made or something right but in this setting like the population that you have is dependent on the decisions that are made previously. So, you know, like if as a as a 15 year old, you choose to go on the rocket to Mars, well, you know, you're, um, I guess, like you're cutting out a bunch of potential people that you could have been on Earth uh, <laughs> and, you know, whatever. Right. And there's a question of like, OK, should only the people that end up existing matter in this vote or even the ones that didn't exist? So, you know, like should your family self on earth be able to vote and say oh no i don't go to mars that's a stupid decision or something like that right um and so there's this question of like okay should you only consider on path selves for this kind of social choice problem or even off path selves um and i think like i don't know to some degree it seems like off path seems more robust to issues because you know you could say well you know say that you have some kind of like addiction path where, you know, everybody on path is like happy with, you know, or not happy, but, you know, like prefers certain, certain like, a, I don't know, yeah, say for the sake of examples, prefers to stay on this path, um, you know, like, even though everybody else, like all the other selves might say that this is a terrible idea, or, you know, joining a cult or something, maybe that's a better yeah. example. Um, you know, I guess like if you have off pass off path selves being able to vote, that seems like it would make it a bit more robust to these kind of degenerate examples. But at the same time, if you consider off path selves, well, you know, there's all sorts of selves off path. And how do you consider what counts as a self or like, I don't know, like kind of, yeah, quant there's like infinitely many off path selves yeah. potentially or whatever, right? Like, I guess there's like a lot of a lot of issues. Um, but but yeah, I, that's definitely something that I'm interested in, like exploring more. Right? Yeah, I'd love to chat more about it if that's something you're interested in. And I think that there's probably some like things that are can be kind of like directly kind of applied from social choice theory. Like even like arrows impossibility theorem seems like it yeah. would have some kind of you know um, um, equivalent here. Uh, and I think that, that would be cool to kind of uh, really make that connection more more directly. Um, yeah. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And I don't know if there is any question, otherwise I have another one, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so. Oh, Karim, did you say you've got another question? Yeah, but I would rather like, let someone else ask a question. You've got six minutes. Okay. You can do it. Okay, really quick. Um, you, you mentioned uh, very often, and I'm, I mean, I've been thinking a bit about more of these things, about like Dylan works, in, in, like, you know, serial, and I think this relates also like with inverse world design and all these type of things. But I also like have a difficulty in making a clear connection between all these things. Do you do do you think there is a underlying for formalism that we can find between like this approach, like between like this work or like a zero inverse world design and similar? Because when I was thinking more about it, I always I always saw like some connection, but it's like the bridge is like very fuzzy, let's say. And then, I don't know, since you mentioned, I think you talked a little, a little more about this. So I don't know if you have any thoughts. Uh, also very general thoughts is okay. Or we can talk, chat better on the time. Right, right. So, I mean, I think like, yeah, I don't know. There, so, yeah, I, I feel like the picture is relatively clear in my head. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if this isn't... Uh, if whatever I say doesn't clarify it to you, feel free to ask follow-ups. But mm -hmm. um, to some degree, it's like it seems like Searle is assuming that the person knows what they want, or like the person has a known reward function, but the reward function is unknown to the AI system. And yeah. you know, how does the AI, how is the AI supposed to act? One could imagine like the opposite setting, which is like what DRMDPs do, where it's like the person, you know, doesn't know their reward function, or at least their reward function is changing over time but the AI system knows exactly what these reward functions are, right? Um, then one could even imagine like, um, yeah, like I guess a setting where, the, which is kind of what I, I was discussing when Steve asked this question, like a setting where the person doesn't know their reward function. So it's like, maybe it's not changing. Like we're assuming that the reward function is fixed, but the person doesn't know it. So it's kind of unknown. Uh, and the AI system either knows 
the uncertainty of the human, or maybe they don't even know how uncertain the human is. So, you know, you can have the more sorrow like thing. Mm -hmm. um, like, it's basically, I think it's like a, a cube <laughs> of different possibilities, like where the axes of the cube are, does the AI system know uh, what the, like, does the AI system know what's going on in the human's head perfectly? And if not, then you're kind of like in the sorrow like setting where you need to like uh, learn what's, what's going on. Uh, the other axis is like, can preferences change? Um, and, uh, the other axis is like, is the human certain about their own reward function or are their beliefs about the reward, their own reward function changing? And so you can imagine the craziest setting in this, in this cube where it's like, uh, you know, the person is uncertain about their reward function, their reward function may be changing and the AI system knows nothing about what's going on in the human's head. So it has to learn what's going on and differentiate between, oh, them learning about the reward function, their reward function being like changing over time um, and, you know, I guess assisting them and yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. that's like, you know, Searle extra extra or something, yeah, right? Or Searle plus plus, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, it, it clarified the, the picture that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. Amazing, thank you, Micah. Do we have yeah. any last questions? No, no, just, I'll just check if anyone's got their hand up. Okay, amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming to chat to us, Micah. That was really interesting and thought-provoking. How can yeah. people contact you if they want to learn more in the future? Um, you can just contact me at my email that I, think should be on my website um or yeah i don't know um yeah i'm pretty sure it is on my website <laughs> um, okay, but yeah thank, thank you so you much so this is great yeah um it's great thank you for talking at the speaker series thank you